So we're, we're recording now. I'm gonna say that again for recording's sake. I'm Bess Murphy. Um, I'm the curator at the Coast Center for the Arts. We're very excited to be back for episode 17 of Collection Spotlight, um, which is a wonderful ongoing program where um, we bring together pieces from the Coast Center collection. We have a collection of global indigenous arts, around 2,300 pieces in our collection. Um, that is a hands-on and interactive collection here in Santa Fe. So hopefully anybody who is coming into town um, or who is in town uh, can know that they're welcome, always welcome to come in for a visit, spend time researching in the collection, uh, speaking with the collection. And actually, America, you were asking if we have an announcement. I do have an announcement. I completely forgot. Uh, we're starting up again, our first Friday's open house. So the first Friday of every month, we have an open house from 1 to 4 p.m. So that's going to start up in October. Um, we're looking forward to having slightly more formal uh, open hours but always we're here and available by appointment. And in some ways that's really nice because you get to have a very intimate visit, um, sort of one-on-one -on -one with the collection. And I will be your hands here today for the co uh, to share the pieces that our guest artist, Lisa selected to work with today. So I'll pass it over to America to talk about our wonderful partnership with First American Art Magazine. Sure, and I'm America Meredith. Um editor of First American Art Magazine. So we're a print and digital quarterly um, publication. We are a journal, we are not an academic journal covering North and South America in digital arts from all areas. And um, I'm really glad for this opportunity to have living artists discuss um, historical work. Like sometimes that doesn't happen enough that people are kind of afraid of historical work. So I'm really grateful today that Lisa Rutherford has agreed to speak with us. She is coming from Cherokee Nation, um, Tahlequah, and she's good at everything. She is a Cherokee um, Nation national treasure. She's a ceramic artist, a textile artist, a Cherokee beadwork artist. Um, and you can see behind her, um, she also has been really instrumental in the revival of um, feather capes, um, which are absolutely gorgeous. And you do see them at major events now, like the opening of the First Americans Museum that just happened this weekend. I saw some Cherokee people looking pretty awesome. So Lisa, do you want to um, say anything else about your artwork? And then we can um, dive into the art. I, I'm not good at talking about myself. Um, but I, I am an artist. I'm also a living history interpreter. So uh, that is why I do a lot of the diverse arts because I've learned to do different skills from different time periods in order to demonstrate them at different events. Like when I worked at the Cherokee Heritage Center in the, the 1710 Village, um, I was sitting there alongside Noel Grayson, Danny McCarter, um, Steve Doherty. They were all working on everything from bows, blowguns, flint napping. Um, I learned a lot from them and um, I've just picked up a lot of different skills. Some of them I don't know well, I know well enough to demonstrate and talk about, but uh, primarily uh, the feather capes, the beadwork, textiles and the pottery are my uh, primary arts. And you're also coming to us from the Cherokee Arts Center. Do you wanna speak about that a little bit? Yes, I wanna to try to get this thing off the screen first of all. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, I had a, a, there was a bar across my face. <laughs> oh, no. But um, I, obviously you guys couldn't see it, but I got it. No, I got it. So yeah, I'm here at the Cherokee Arts Center, uh, which is owned by the Cherokee Nation. Uh, my friend Matt Anderson has been helping hey. me set up here. So I uh, don't know what I would do without Matt. But uh, this is a really, uh, really neat art center. It is a community art center. So it can be used by anyone. Um, you have to be a tribal citizen to to rent studio space to sell in the gallery but if you want to teach or take classes here um everyone is welcome to do so even non-tribal members yeah yeah, <gasps> they anyone, opened it up. yeah they could come and uh there's a fee of course um small fee for the room space and using the facilities but uh, if I wanted to teach a class, then uh, anyone in the community would be welcome to take the class. 
Oh, that's amazing. So it's a really great resource. And then we have the spider gallery across the way where we can sell our work. So that's a, been a big asset, a big help to me. I can, I rent studio space here, although I am working on a studio at home. Um, I like the creative energy of, of this facility, all the, uh, there's elders that come in. Um, you, you never know who you're gonna see in the art center. Uh, different artists come in to make prints, to use different equipment. So it's, it's a pretty lively place at times. And then do you wanna start with the first uh, piece? Yeah. Um, so I'll ask. And this will be very eclectic because Lisa's good at everything, pretty much. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, and I Even forgot oil painting. Which we were trying to remember, and of course, none of us did. But um, you're welcome to ask questions throughout our conversation. You can just type them into the chat um, as we're speaking and we can read them out. And at the end, we'll open it up to questions so you can unmute at the very end. So um, yay, <laughs> finally remembered to mention that. So here's the first piece that we're gonna talk about. And I'm gonna sort of scooch back a little bit so that I can hold this up better. Oh yeah, so this piece is attributed to Eastern Band. Um, I forgot the year already. <laughs> 1970. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, so it's not um, a terribly old piece, but I, I like this sash. It does have different elements of the Cherokee beadwork on it, the white outline, uh, and this scroll pattern that you see. Um, this is one that I made. This is seen on most of the sashes. And that one has the, you'll see around the edges as this one as well. You see that bead stitch is uh, pretty much unique to Cherokee beadwork. It is a flat, um, it's a lot like the edging stitch, the three bead edging, but it's a three bead flat stitch. And um, of course I was taught by Martha Berry, who's also a Cherokee National Treasure for beadwork. And Martha says she's never seen that stitch used on anything other than the sashes. Mm -hmm. So I sometimes use it on other things, but um, historically, uh, she did her research at the Smithsonian facilities, I believe, and she wasn't able to find any other, uh, that stitch used on any other type of beadwork or objects. So Speak a little more about what the Baldrick sashes are, who used them and how they used them. They're today, they're pretty much used in dance, but they're worn like um, diagonally across the body. Um, and they have the ribbons, so they tie. So uh, they're uh, probably ceremonial. I think they wear them at the ceremonial grounds a lot, but um, this is the first one I have completed. Um, the spiral design is usually on all of them. You'll see white outline on them. Uh, they usually are red and blue. These are the colors. That one looks like black. It is uh, black. Yep. Yeah. These were the colors used um, that were most commonly listed on the trade lists uh, starting in the, well, actually the 1690s is when we started trading for wool and linen and um, other items from England. The, the blue and the red were the most popular ones. I'll take this thing off. But they're uh, usually bound with silk ribbon and on the back, this is a reproduction print that I got at Colonial Williamsburg. And um, I recognize this print interestingly enough uh, my friend Shan Goshorn actually bought this fabric at Colonial Williamsburg and had me make her a vest from it. So a little hello from Shan here. Um, I didn't realize that till I just picked this up. But, oh, that's um, cool. She popped in to say hello, I guess. Um, of course, she was a huge influence on my art career. Um, but this, the sash is pretty much 
Now you might see them worn maybe formal occasions, um, but in the past they were pretty much for the ceremonies and the dances. Which and war. Like, Good old war. <laughs> Because they identified the men, men wore them, and they identified the villages. So this is actually shocking. I was shocked that this was a Cherokee shash being made in 1970. So like most of the collections, you'll see Cushada and uh, Alabama and above all, uh, Mississippi Choctaw making these sashes. And uh, Creek people used to make them, all Southeastern people used to make them, but the Mississippi Choctaw never stopped. They always continued making these. And it's always this very limited palette. Yeah, so we were hoping that maybe we could find out who the artist was. And I know, uh, Bess, you wrote the Koala Arts and right. Crafts Mutual on the Koala Boundary. Did they get back and say anything or? No, we haven't heard back yet, but hopefully, well, I heard back a, and very quick response that they're going to work on it. So we oh, haven't cool. got any more information at this point, but that is actually where Ted Co purchased the piece originally in. So the piece we think was made in the early 1970s. He purchased this piece in the early 1980s. So probably around 81, 82 when he was on a trip there. So um, unfortunately we didn't have any more information about who the maker was or anything like that. So we're really excited that maybe we can get some more some more info to add to our records as well. What is the fabric? Is, it doesn't look like wool from here. Is, no, is... it's cotton. Okay. Yeah. Yep. On, on both parts, the black and the red are both cotton. Okay. Let's see. So, just really simple on the backing. Yeah, it's very pretty. It looks like it's yeah, very beautiful. well made. Yeah, yeah. And then people talk about the use of the white shell being really important, especially with early Southeastern beadwork, because it kind of replaces uh, the hand ground shell beads that some people still make and work with. But uh, freshwater pearls and, you know, shells being made into beads, you can see how uh, uh, pre-made glass beads trade ups would be really appreciated just for the time that you save. Yeah. Yeah, I've actually tried to make shell beads. Um, oh, my gosh. I, I took Nagoti Scott's class. Uh, I started back in, I think 2012, but then I lost my job and I couldn't afford to continue until Cherokee Nation started the um, Cherokee National Treasure Mentor Program. So through this program, you can take long-term classes to really learn an art. And instead of just a, a week or two, you can work with the artist uh, for months and you learn all aspects of it and the class is free to the students. So the instructors paid by the tribe. So that was a very valuable program and Nagoti taught me to make shell beads and mine are still on the little wire in the in my box and they're not finished. Um, I've made other items but um, once he started teaching again, I was able to take his class for a couple of years. And since he's passed on, actually these whiteboards behind me on the reverse of one of those is his class lesson plan. And none of us have had the heart to erase it since he's passed on. So every week we had um, a detailed lesson plan written out, uh, very thorough of what we were gonna accomplish that week. So uh, we've just left that on there. Lisa, if I can interject, the only classes that the heritage uh, that the art center uh, excludes the public on would just would be these mentorship apprentice programs. They're the only ones that are Cherokee only. Yeah, yeah, you have to be Cherokee citizens to be part of those classes, and they fill up very fast. So usually by the time. Uh, someone decides to teach they've already got their students before so you don't really get to advertise so uh, you get a little bit of um, competition going to get in those classes um i have a question lisa because i know you mentioned the spiral and then i think in our conversation the other day we were also talking about this form as well do you want to yeah the cross um the, that could be a fire symbol. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the cross is a fire symbol. Um, 
I remember Benny Smith talking to us. Uh, he, of course, was Stokes Smith or Redbird Smith's grandson. And I remember him talking about that symbol. He said, where the, the pieces cross the X, that is the where the fire is in the center. So um, that's not really, uh, not um, square, I guess you would say, but um, it could be. And this spiral, I noticed several years ago, I was watching uh, dancers. I was in the bleachers at, I was in North Carolina at their amphitheater watching into these hills. And when the dancers left the stage, this pattern was in the sand where they had been dancing around. They dance around to the center, they come back out. So I, I thought that was really interesting that from my vantage point, um, this looks like the steps in the dance and then the sashes are usually worn at the dances. And then these spirals are very widespread throughout the ceramics too. Yeah, a lot of different, I use the same symbolism on a lot of different things. Like uh, I don't have any, but I've got some of my pottery here, but I don't have any that has that, <clears throat> excuse me, that has that symbol. Um, but yeah, it's pretty, um, pretty widespread. And I'm looking down, I've got all my art on the table. So it looks yeah, like look I'm, it getting, I'm, re I'm really looking at my art. I uh, was trying to see if there's anything that has that symbol on it. Did you want to go to the moccasins next or the pottery? Uh, let's do moccasins. So these are not Cherokee, not even remotely. The next two. <laughs> I. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> I'm not going to rule it out. I'm never going to say never, but from the shape of the, um, like this is a, a pair of mine that I've made these flaps more square just because I was putting the beadwork the applique on them. Those seem to come very much forward. Um, my old ones, they come a little bit more forward, but most of the, the, Historic Cherokee ones are come forward and are more rounded. They don't come to this point. And these are my personal moccasins that I've been wearing forever that are getting worn out. Beadwork's getting loose on them. Uh, this was probably the first pair I made that I applicate on there. So I would do a lot of things different today. <clears throat> but the I, I wish I could see under the the cloth on those. The, and then, so let me see if I can take uh, the stuffing out and if I can get the light in. I'm happy to take the stuffing yeah, out. Yeah, I would like to see it's what they, because yeah. the Cherokee moccasins have the, uh, gathers the pucker toe. And a lot of people in Oklahoma turn theirs inside out. I have not seen any historic ones that are turned inside out. But oh, so the so seams visible at the top? Yeah, they like turn them sticking out at the top. That's weird. Sorry, <laughs> that is strange. This is, how, this is how the most of the historic ones, and they're usually a lot finer. I can't really cut my leather thongs that fine. Um, these are these are my living history ones. These are brain tanned leather. Mm. Uh, you can see my Dr. Schultz in there, <laughs> <laughs> and my hawk bells. Those are my trademark. Um, and you're adding, um, you're adding a base to them, like something to the bottom, because you yeah, have to walk on one. concrete. Now, this is just a single piece of deer hide, right? The historic one you have? Yeah. These have the longer flaps because I wear them wrapped around my ankles. Oh, cool. And you can see I have sewn my flaps on separately. That's a good way to save leather if you've got when you lay them out, um, it takes quite a bit of leather because of, you've got the round part for the toe and then the, the ears for the flaps are sticking out. But if you could cut these two round parts together like this, then you could get those flaps out of smaller pieces of scrap. So that's a good way to conserve leather. One of my tricks that I learned working in the village. Um, and you know, if they wear out, you could take them off 
I've also done that with these, it looks like. Oh, they've been replaced? You could replace them. These haven't, but I don't know why I did that, but they're, they're kind of old. But those, I wonder what leather that is. It kind of reminds me of the groundhog hide. I've seen some at NMAI. Um, I'm gonna see know. if I can get it so that you can see inside the toe. It's tricky to see if I can get the <laughs> light in the right angle. Yeah. I don't I know. know you need a bonus to... person with a flashlight. I know exactly. I'm like, how many hands do I have right now? My but, trick yeah. is to take my camera and put the camera inside and snap a picture. <laughs> well, I can definitely try but, and do yeah, that. That's, but then that's really the to... only way that you can yeah. kind of see what's yeah, concealed exactly there. Over here. So I can describe as well. Let me see. I don't know if we'll be able to get the light in. No. Nope. But this hide, the, yeah, it is strange how it's like kind of disintegrating a little bit in ways yeah. that I haven't seen deer hide do. It's got the strange uh, texture. It does. It, yeah. it looks like cork or something, but. Um, yeah, it's, is that calico instead of ribbon on the edge? Yes, can you see It's that? really beautiful. It's really extraordinary. It just looks very different. And then the edging, that edging beadwork's so different. Yeah. Now, some of the Cherokee moccasins that I saw at NMAI had arched cuffs. They, uh, like, they stood up. They were shaped more like this, but they just stood up and were kind of curved. So they didn't really have the flaps. They were just little cuffs, and I, I really want a pair. Um, <laughs> I just haven't made them, but there was a, a beautiful pair that I studied there. Um, and those beads are a little bit larger. Yeah. Like about yeah. tens or eights. And is that kind of a diagnostic too? I mean, that this might be a much earlier piece, that it's larger um, beads, only white beads? It could be. But is there so any estimation about how old these are? And they're, they're from a, theoretically found in a, a farm's a farmhouse in Virginia? In Virginia, yeah. And so we have them dated to around 1840 to 1860. But uh, I mean, we've we've talked a lot about in, in, in our conversations about the record that we have. And so, you know, the identification that we have on these is really broad. We literally have Cherokee, Choctaw Creek, North Carolina, South Carolina, Western Tennessee. Um, and so it, it's very, very broad on these. So I love these conversations because it really helps me um, add add more to our records and, and complicate what we have and and revisit what we have in our records, so. Well, and NMEI, in their collections, they did have a moccasin that looked kind of similar to that and it was Niantic. So it was from Rhode Island and, uh, and uh, Connecticut. So, I mean, people traveled up and down and they traded up and down too. Mm -hmm. I mean, people traveled like crazy in the old days. So Adriana's recommending that we consult with Michael Gabon. Gabon. And then um, just to backtrack, Lisa, do you want to describe what a pucker toe moccasin is for anyone who's not familiar? Yeah, they, um... You start out here with a toe, you sew it with a baseball stitch, like, and most of them you sew part of the way up and then it's a running stitch the rest of the way. So it's all cut in one piece, unless you do the flap separately like I did. Um, and you have a seam up the back too. Yes, there's a seam up the back. Most of them, I didn't show you my other, my fancy ones. Um, these were part of an outfit that. Yes, that's great. Um, these go with an outfit that was in the um, what, what, weaving history into art, the enduring legacy of Shan Gosworn at Gilcrease Museum. Um, there's a skirt that has some matching pattern that I should have brought in here. It's in the other room. And uh, there was a beaded purse that went with it, that, which is the one I can't find. Mm. So at the moment, I'm kind of between studios. I'm working up here part of the time. I'm working at home. Um, 
and then last winter I had a flood in my house so I was just we had had to move some of my stuff home when we were closed down for the pandemic so I started throwing boxes just anywhere and everywhere to get them out of the way and now I'm still digging my way out of that mess so somewhere in my house there's a purse that matches oh yeah can I find that but hopefully um Hopefully it'll, it'll probably appear now that I don't need to talk about it. But these are a more contemporary type of moccasin. They've got the silk, well, that may be faux silk ribbon on them. And this is actually not ribbon work. Lisa, okay. can you hold that up just sort of slow to the camera and just sort of sit there for a second? Oh, nice. Oh yeah. Yeah, that is actually beautiful. rickrack that I positioned to make the, the diamond shape. Well, the yellow shows. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I've done the back of these a little bit different. I've made the, the upside down Y seam in the heel. Ah. And this one looks like it needs to be tightened up a little bit. I should have shown the other one. It looks better. So you've worn those and the soles look that clean? No, I haven't worn these. Oh, okay. I was like, what magic is this? <laughs> now, this is the ones I wear. Okay. I, I wore them last good. weekend. Uh, this is a, a foam, foam sole material that I ordered online. I don't recommend it because um, if there's dew on the grass, it soaks it up. And if you walk on a concrete floor or rocks, it is so slick. Oh, scary. So these have, they've got the same thing. But normally I'll just put a thicker piece of leather on the soles. So did you want to look at the Delaware, I mean the, yeah, Delaware Cato moccasins? Yeah. So those last ones are kind of coastal and these are still, you know, sort of eastern woodlands but kind of the western corner of eastern woodlands yeah those look more like the historic cherokee moccasins with the beadwork on the toe um, of course we use a lot of the negative space as part of our design on our beadwork and it does look like maybe wool on the flaps. Looks like velvet. Velvet. Oh, velvet. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. The red is velvet and then the blue is like a satin ribbon. Yeah. Yeah, maybe it's a little bit more color than um, the earlier designs were usually primarily white beads. But then when you get closer to the 1800s, um, I think Cherokee beadwork kind of kind of drifted away after after the Trail of Tears. I think uh, we quit making it here as much. Uh, maybe people were doing the beadwork other places, but you don't see a lot here after the um, well, 1842, 1843, when they had the International Indian Council here in Tahlequah. And there's the, the John Mix Stanley painting, and you can see a lot of people wearing beadwork there. But after that point, you don't see a lot uh, that was still being made until more modern times. I like the little flowers, the little daisy flowers. Oh, those are gorgeous. And then it's still using those same ribbons for the edge. And it still has that pucker toe, but everything else is totally different. And we have no date on these, so um, interesting to think about. Oh, they covered the back seam, yeah. So one of the things I do to my moccasins uh, when they start to wear out, because um, I have, oh, I, I don't know how many pairs I have, probably eight, nine. Um, Fancy. The, the, the back seam here, if they get wet and start stretching, which usually your brain tan doesn't stretch like the others, but sometimes they'll tend to get worn out right here, uh, especially if you're, you can see I've been walking on that a little bit. Um, 
sides. So I've sewn them back up with sinew, kind of cut them off, sewn them up. And when it gets where it's too fragile to really sew anymore, I take another strip of deer skin and I just overlap it and take it under the heel and just whip stitch it on both sides. And then it supports the fragile seam. So oh, I've got cool. a couple of pairs like that that I've still, gosh, I've got one pair I've had probably since 2006 maybe that I have worn consistently. So these are tough I and mean, they look delicate, but they aren't. Yeah. So when I worked in the village that one of my coworkers, I ended up having to make him new moccasins. Like it seemed like every two to three weeks. I'm like, oh my God. what are you doing to them? He was washing them and putting them in the dryer, <laughs> putting them through a washer and dryer. <laughs> he said, well, they're dirty. <laughs> Well, that was rather amusing. Don't do that. That's not good. <laughs> but if you take care of them, they will last years. They're not socks. That's what I was yeah. just going to say. They're not socks. Oh. Uh, yeah. That was a fun job. And then, do you have some of your ceramics that you'd like to talk about? or? Um, I've got a few things over here. Hoist them up. Bead work out of the way. And who did you study with? Um, Jane Austey was uh, my primary teacher. This is one of the pots I made. Oh, that's gorgeous. Um, it's stamped with a hardwood paddle on the base of it. And the top has been polished with a stone and I'm getting a glare on it. But you can see the paddle design. And then I've incised a design at the rim of it. So this one has actually been fired in a kiln and then I put it in a wood fire to get the coloring on it. I have asthma, so if I do a wood firing outside, I'm gonna be sick for about four days because the only time of year it seems like it's optimal firing weather, it's 100 degrees. So I don't do a full pit firing very often. But this is another little typical Cherokee pot. Um, it's also stamped. That's the Uktan stamp that I believe that's the stamp Joel Queen gave to me. So Joel Queen, who's Eastern Band Cherokee, he's kind of the one that reintroduced stamping to um, Oklahoma. Joel and uh, Tammy Bean, um, mm -hmm. she's from Alabama. Jane and I back in, I think it was 2005 when I first started taking pottery with Jane, um, we went to a pottery conference, a Kuala pottery conference at uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where we met Joel and Tammy. And we learned then that the Eastern Band had revived this paddle stamp technique, which was, I don't know if you could really see the stamping that clearly on it. If you just hold it not. there, yeah. maybe move to your left, yeah, and hold it for just a second. Sometimes it'll take a second and then it'll focus. Maybe not. A little yeah. bit, yeah. A little bit. It looks like a skull. Mm -hmm. Skull size. It's got a face on it. Uh, but the, the paddles themselves, they can be wood and they can be ceramic. And you're basically beating a wet, uh, after you've constructed the pot, when it's still wet. Yeah, they're coil construction. When they get leather hard, then you have to support it on the inside. And then you smack it. You have to smack it pretty hard with a paddle to get your imprint on there. And it knocks it out of shape. And then you got you have to support it and get it back into shape without stretching it out and getting the little uh, stress cracks in it. Uh, this rim is a folded down rim. This is a historic rim that you see on a lot of the Cherokee and Mississippi Mississippian pots. And then I've uh, pressed into it with a, some sort of a stick or something. Uh, that's I love it when you can see people's fingerprints or um, thumbnail prints, you know. Yeah, a lot of people the did. They use their thumbs in there. Yeah. So. And that incising, I mean, there's much more incising than there is painting in the Southeast when it comes to decorating pots. Yeah, we didn't do a lot of polychrome pots. Um, you see some... Um, some of the slip painted ones, which I am terrible at. I'm not 
Anna Mitchell was a master at that. And Anna, of course, is the one that taught my teacher, Jane Austey. Uh, she's the one that pretty much revived the, the Cherokee pottery here in Oklahoma because after the Trail of Tears, no one was doing it. Everyone no was- Cherokees, Creek people were, Muskogee people were. But we were focused on survival. We were not really, we didn't need them. We had other forms of vessels, but um, Anna in 1968 or nine, I believe, uh, she started researching it and um, she, she didn't have the carved wood paddles, so she made clay stamps to stamp the designs. But she taught Jane and several other potters. So pretty much any of us now that are doing pottery, if we weren't taught by Anna herself, we were probably taught by one of her students. So I was fortunate enough to take classes, uh, a few classes with Anna, but Jane was my teacher. And then um, for the more contemporary, I worked with Bill Glass out of his studio. Um, I did a sculpture class with him for what, two years, three years uh, through the mentorship program. So I learned a lot of different types of um, ceramic art from, from Bill. So I've had many, many teachers. <laughs> so this pot is another incised pot. And, and that is a really polished. A freeform design. And I think this is the, I'm not sure which clay that is. I thought it was the Lysella Georgia clay, but I don't think it is. I don't see any. Uh, it usually has little flecks of mica in it, and I don't see any in this. But you can see the smoke clouds on it, and it's pretty highly polished. Usually, Lysella doesn't polish up. You can get a big shine like this, but it's it's work. It's a lot of work to do. It's a more coarse, gritty clay. But um, this is pretty typical with the incised designs. Um, this is one of my favorite ways to decorate a pot. Here's an incised one that you can show them. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God, that's huge. My assistant here. Yeah, this is one that I did a while back. That is enormous. Smoke clouds and everything on it. God, that's beautiful. How heavy is it? Oh, it's not too heavy. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When I was an undergrad student, this um, other student said, whenever you see Jane Ossie's pots, put your ear up to it. They all have their own unique sound. So probably every pot has that. But, uh, those really <laughs> large ones, you can really hear a sound out of them. Yeah, Jane always taught us to listen to them. <laughs> this one is one of your Lysella pieces because yeah. it has the gold flecks inside it. This is the Lysella nice. play. Uh, I don't know if you can see the... I don't know. Oh, you can really see the stamping on that one. Yeah, and this has the applique handles. Cool. And then one more stamped and incised pot. Yeah, this one is one. This is a uh, local clay. Uh, oh, cool. It's been hand dug and processed, and it was uh, pit fired. So you see the variation in the colors. Uh, when you do a wood firing, a, a pit firing, you get a lot of different colors. Well, like, well, here's a red, there's browns and corals and blacks and grays. Um, the lighter spot, this side probably got hotter. Um, the hotter it is, the lighter your pot's going to be. So like if this was broken, that black color, it's not just on the surface, it will go about halfway through the pot. Oh, wow. So, yeah, don't ask me how I know what the inside of <laughs> broken pots look like. <laughs> yeah, I've blown up my share. I know it's funny when Joel Queen, um, you know, came from North Carolina and started showing at Indian Market, he had this amazing blackware pottery. And I think some local, you know, New Mexican potters, Pueblo potters were kind of like, what? what's up with that? But there is pre-contact uh, blackware pottery from the East and, um, Part of it, the process, isn't it using dung that keeps the oxygen out and makes it black? Um, you can use you can use that. You can use wood, grass, just about anything if, as long as you uh, cover it and cut the oxygen. I've got a black one before, just uh, with just wood. Oh, uh, cool. 
I had, it was a very highly polished one and I just put it in a wash tub to fire it and put a lid on it. So um, it came out just shiny black. So interestingly enough, Joel's black pottery is made from white clay. Oh, wow, that's a transformation. It, yeah, he says it takes the color better. So I actually went to his clay source um, and asked to buy some of the, the kind of clay that he used and they wouldn't sell it to me. They said, no, that's his, he, I guess he had a special uh, formula. He had them mix for him. <laughs> so I wasn't trying, Very loyal. trying to get his you know, formula or anything. I, I didn't know that it was a, a specific mix, but they absolutely wouldn't sell it to me. <laughs> And then did we want to look at the spiral pot? Yes, let's look at the spiral pot. And have you had people look and like try to pinpoint like where things are? Because that's the most interesting thing about spiral is it's so archaeologically rich. I mean, there's such a wealth of materials and much of it was made locally and then much of it was made elsewhere and imported. So my understanding is there's turquoise from New Mexico that was found there. There's a uh, ancestral Pueblo cotton fabric that was found there. And there's also, you know, a vast amount of things that came from Cahokia and other Degea, Suin people. So, you know, the ancestors of the Osage, Quapa, Ponca, Omaha people, you know, that their artworks all there. So was there any discussion about maybe who might have made this pot? This? Not yet. I mean, yeah. you know, I think the history of our collection is that it was in Tedco's home for um, a very, very long time. And so, you know, we've been here open to the public for like eight years now. And the opportunities are really rich for spending time and digging into these pieces. So anybody who wants to come over and uh, do some more research in our collection, it would be, it's, it's a good opportunity because a lot of this is really um, understudied, I will say, and, you know, between programs and other things, we only have so much time to study the collection as well. Hopefully we can do more and more and more. But yeah, this piece really, I don't know that anybody has actually honestly pulled this out to, to work with on any visits. So I would, I would love to have it get a little more attention too. So it's nice to be able to share it today. So yeah. this is, Spyro is mainly associated with a uh, Caddo and Wichita people, which of course they're not one tribe, each of them, they're a vast confederacy of many, many tribes in Eastern Oklahoma and surrounding states. But um, it's fascinating that you've traveled, you know, what, 700 miles due west and you're still seeing that scroll pattern. Yeah, I got to, um... I got to see some of the spiral artifacts at NMAI. I, I don't think I got to see very much of the pottery because I was focused on textiles on that trip. Um, I did get to see a lot of those shell carvings. But yeah, again, it has that scroll pattern that is uh, pretty similar to what I have here. I'm trying to see, yeah, it looks like they incised it with something kind of wide. Yeah. The lines, the, the vertical lines look wider. Yeah, really thick. I wonder, I'm wondering if it's incised or a lot of times I take a shell when I'm doing something like that and I rock that shell, make like a rocker stamp. Hmm. So, hmm. no, they do the For the vertical lines? Yeah, for the background, the for the texture. Let's see. I'm really into texture. I use yeah. I have all kinds of things. I use dried corn cobs, dried ears of corn. Um, this little pot here. Um, this I, I'm not sure if it was a walnut. No, this one is the pine cone. Well, the little bitty pine cones when they're still closed up. Um, that's what I used to stamp this one. I do use the cool. black walnuts a lot. Um, I just use a lot of different organic things. Shells are one of my favorite. 
So that's what made me think that could have been like a little rocker stamp shell, but I think they're probably incised. It looks like it was incised and then maybe the, the surface texture, it was sort of like rubbed or something yeah. like that after the fact. So after the incision was made, trying to get a better. Yeah. Because you can see how some of that surface, um, that texturing sort of changed the surface of where it was incised, I guess, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And this looks like it might be tempered with uh, muscle shells because you can kind of see little bits of white come to the surface. And that's the thing about uh, the muscle shell tempered ceramics. They're never going to be glossy and smooth, uh, like yeah. grit or grog tempered. Yeah, a lot of times the little shells will blow out and firing. I've never really used the shell. I've, um, I've used the cattail fiber. And I don't remember if I ever fired it. It may still be sitting in there in my drying rag. So Adriana was wondering, Lisa, have you ever used uh, cordage or any kind of fabric? To yeah, that's actually why I started doing the twining is because in North Carolina, we saw some pottery that was imprinted with the twine textiles. And I wanted to, I, I started making little squares of it just to stamp my pots with. And then of course you can wrap a cord around a stick or a paddle and paddle it with that. But once I started learning twining, I thought, well, I can make a bag. And yeah. this took off from there. So, uh, but that is actually what got me into the twine textiles. Um, so yeah, I, I do, I really like the cordage. Um, normally when I demonstrate, I have several little squares, little examples of the twine textile that I've used and, um, at one time I had a, a whole set of all my texture tools so I could lay them out for people to see them. But since I haven't really demonstrated pottery, I think 2019 at uh, NMAI was the last time that I really got to demonstrate. Um, no, we did a, a short demonstration at Philbrook. Oh, cool. November, but I didn't, this was when the, uh, COVID numbers had started going down when I agreed to do this and they started going up. Yeah. So I had to get a barrier in front of me because people <laughs> get, kids would come up to my table and lean like this right in my yeah. face with no mask and they're touching everything. So, um, well, maybe this is a little early to demonstrate. So yeah. we're coming to the end and I'd love to have some time for questions, but also before, can we get a closer look at your feather cape? Do you want to talk about the feather capes? Oh, uh, this one is what I'm working on. And those are just glorious. Yeah, they're made on a net, hand-tied net base. And the feathers, these are goose feathers and these are duck. And legally, what kind of feathers can you use? Um, there's kind of um, an unanswered question about wild turkey feathers. Hmm. I don't like to use them because they're hard to work with, but some one state refused to sell to me because they said it was illegal in Oklahoma, but we've had artists call the wildlife department and attorneys, and nobody can give us a definite answer. So anything that there's a season on, you can use. Okay, so anything it's okay to hunt? And then domestic, so. Yeah, there's a lot of domestic turkeys that look like the, um, well, we had some out at Hunter's Home, the uh, standard bronzes, I believe. Look, and then there's a, a broad-breasted turkey that they look like the wild ones. Yeah, domestic turkeys are awesome. They're so beautiful anyway. Yeah, they're fun. And you can do swan too, huh? I, I've never done swan. That would be interesting. Look, I know the feathers used at Spyro. At uh, one time, someone had sent me um, an analysis of the feathers in, I think, Craig Mound. And they were primarily Canada goose, uh, wild turkey. Canada and goose. Some of them were uh, a very, very small percentage were swan. But of course, since it had been dynamited and everything, we don't know what uh, 
what type of object they had been made into. What I was hoping everyone could see was what I see is the blue and the purple and the green that are in this shoulder piece. I don't know if we could see it earlier. Yes. Yeah. No, no, but now you can. Yeah, and this is an unfinished piece. I still have a lot of work to do on that. But you've done you've done men's and women's. So what are kind of the, some of the differences? Um, I think I've not found really a lot of evidence that the women wore the uh, the capes with the the wild turkey tail feathers. I kind of think that was they were they were called warrior birds, and you see a lot of the men. Um, you see depictions of them wearing them into battle, so I'm not real clear if women were wearing those, but the twine textiles where they're actually twining the, the smaller feathers into the fabric, I think women wore those. And everyone says the beloved woman wore a, a white feather cape, and I've never been able to find any evidence whatsoever of that. The only thing I can find is that she carried uh, the wing of a swan. So if anybody finds any evidence of that, the beloved woman wearing a white feather cape, please forward it to me. But um, I've been looking for that for a long time. I think that's just a myth. Um, I think they were pretty much worn for warmth. And maybe some of them, depending on the type of bird, were worn for ceremonial uses. Like the war chief had the turkey feather cape. The peace chief um, had a white cape, and and again, I don't know where the documentation is uh, for the white cape. Um, I think I've seen it, but I I'm really terrible at keeping up with my sources. <clears throat> but um, I'm not sure that uh, just the fact that a woman had a white cape that did not mean she's the beloved woman or anything like that. And then so the yeah, around the top, you can see a little bit of the netting that you're creating. Um, can we see any of that? Oh, cool. So you create first this, uh, this twine net, this open work. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's a hand tied net. And you can see that it is contoured, it's shaped. So it's going to fit over the shoulders. Um, I should have put my other outfit on the mannequin and brought it in here. It's finished, but yeah, I've got to do some more work on this one. But it's contoured to fit over your shoulders and it comes to a point in the back. Uh, there were some that were worn over one shoulder that tied under, um, I should have brought the one I had at home, but oh, well. <laughs> I didn't know I was gonna be talking about the feather capes today. But they're so cool. And you're, you've been, I mean, how many do you think you've made? Um, you've been really instrumental in this process. Upwards in the 30s. Dear God. Yeah. I figured out the other day, I, I always said there were 750 to 800 feathers in one. Oh There's more like 950 and more. And when you wow. get the ones that go over one shoulder, um, they have several points to them. They're almost a, a, almost a full circle. So you're getting, I don't know, probably a couple of thousand feathers. I can only tie 80 an hour if I oh sit here and if That's I more than one a minute. So yeah, like if I put on, uh, turn on a video or watch Reservation Dogs or something <laughs> like that, binge that and something that holds my attention, then I can uh, do that. But down here, there's so much, uh, so many things that catch my attention or I'll think of, okay, where is, you know, what did I do? with this particular piece. How did I sew the ribbons on this? And I'll run into the studio to look at that and then I'm down that rabbit hole. So uh, it's kind of a challenge to focus sometimes. Yes, the struggle is real. Yeah. Uh, Evan Mathis, who's um, from Koala Boundary, he's from Cherokee, North Carolina. He's asking that one of the girls in the Little Miss Cherokee pageant um, had actually worn a feather cape that was capped by immature uh, bald eagles, which are this beautiful slate blue. Oh, wow. And um, have you read um, any kind of documentation about that being used historically? No, I haven't. I know that they used 
the most colorful birds they could find. <clears throat> um, any bright colored feathers were used. Uh, there were there were indigenous flamingos. Yeah. Uh, there were uh, the Carolina parakeet. Um, I made a cape a few years back that had a, a like a lime green uh, collar around the top, and everybody kept saying, "Well, that's not traditional." I said, "That's the color of a Carolina parakeet." So, um, so it actually was. But yeah, they had all different colors. So you see the white ones frequently. People like the black ones. I don't like to make the black ones because you soak the feathers in a, a cup of water to soften the quill. You flatten that quill and then you bend it around. I use a little nail, you bend it around and then you uh, take the thread and, and lash it down. So after you do a few of those, your fingers are gonna be black. And I actually tattooed myself one time. Oh no. I stuck myself with a needle. So I was in one of my little fingers. I had a black dot there for years that finally faded away. So I have to be careful. <laughs> so Laura Evans mentioned parrots uh, traded from Southwest, but I don't think that happened to the Southeast, that the parrots were coming in from Mesoamerica into the ancestral Pueblo lands. But um, Matt, Lisa, have you ever heard about going to the Southeast? Um, I know there was a lot of trade. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's indigenous parrots like you mentioned. Yeah, I'm not really clear on what types. I just know there was a Carolina parakeet. Um, yeah. We did have access to colorful birds, um, so we probably didn't have to trade from the Southwest, but definitely if there was, just because there wasn't um, semi-trailers and trains does, doesn't mean that we didn't have connections all over the continent. Yeah. It just took longer to get the merchandise. Yeah, I think people don't, I think people, underestimate how much trade there was going on and how early it was happening. Oh yeah. And then people are always like, oh, there's no connection from the mainland um, Southwest East to uh, the Caribbean. But um, William Bartram in the 1700s, he documented a Seminole warriors hopping in their dugout canoe and going to Cuba to get rum. So I'm like, okay, if they can go on a, on a drink run <laughs> to Cuba in their dugout canoe, they could do proper trips to the Caribbean. Yeah. Hey, but, uh, that was a that was a cake run. It oh, was just for rum cake. Rum. I read rum in my version. <laughs> Priorities. <laughs> so we're we're at five o'clock, but if anyone wants, you can um, demute yourself. I'll make sure that you can demute yourself, and uh, um, you're welcome to ask um, Lisa questions directly. <laughs> well, I have one question. What's your, what's your, so you just quit your job and now you are a full-time mm -hmm. artist. What is your next plan? Which of course the <laughs> pandemic certainly put kinks in things, but what are you going to do? What are your events? Um, I don't really have any events right now. Last or two weeks ago, well, whenever the, the 10th and the 11th and the 12th, uh, we demonstrated down at the Sequoia Birthplace Museum, uh, myself and and Kathy Abercrombie, who's a weaver and a new national treasure. So uh, we went down um, and demonstrated there. And um, it was a little scary. We know the three people there caught COVID. Oh, great. Yeah. We wore our masks and we, we had a sign up that said, if you don't have a mask on, stay six feet from the artist. Nobody honored it. <laughs> you need a stick. Everyone needs six foot long sticks. Yeah, but we, um, we demonstrated there. So yeah, I've been, uh, this is officially August 31st was the end of my employment. Um, so I have been enjoying it so much before I didn't have weekends off. I was all, well, Sunday and Monday were my days off. I had a 30 minute lunch break. Um, I was working in a dark historic house, uh, no sunshine. So now I'm, outside I'm around artists and people and I can go to lunch with people so I am just ecstatic to be a full-time artist again and I've got quite a bit of work lined up uh, oh. I've got a couple of commissions to finish um, I made some ribbon skirts that I was going to sell at my booth at Cherokee National Holiday that got canceled 
but um, yeah. How many more rows of feathers do you have on the cape you're working on to go? Uh, I'll probably put, I'll probably fill in some here because these are kind of small and I'll uh, fill up on the, the top row and I think I'll bind that with ribbon or something probably. It's for a pageant, so I probably shouldn't be showing it since it's for a pageant. No, you, you should. <laughs> We're not going to steal your ideas because it looks insanely complex. I will never even attempt it. <laughs> Adriana Gretchen Green asked earlier um, how one might contact you afterward if they have uh, direct questions they might want to ask you. Um, then... Oh, sorry. Oh, no, you're fine. Instagram, uh, lisa.rutherford.arts. I'm on Facebook, Lisa Rutherford Arts, or you can email me, lisadrutherford at gmail.com. Or you could probably reach me here through the Spider Gallery. I think they, they have a Facebook and a website. And you're represented by the Spider Gallery and also All Things Cherokee down in Texas? Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, thank you all so much. Thanks for um, spending the afternoon with us or an hour of the afternoon. And thank you, Lisa. <laughs> Well, thank you everybody for coming. This is Yay. fun.